Hello my friends and welcome to the Curate's Study for this the sixth Sunday um, of this Easter season. So Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Alleluia. Those who believe in him will never die. Alleluia. Welcome to you today to the Curate Study. My name is Reverend Mark Kerslake and as I say every Sunday, no matter who you are, where you are or what you believe, it's lovely to have you here, even if it's only for a short time in the Curate Study to journey together with me and the rest of us in this digital church into the future. Uh, now, some some exciting things happening at the moment uh, from the Curate Study. So first of all, a big thank you to those people who've dug deep and are helping support our work here in the Curate Study and our efforts to become self-sufficient. Uh, some people have been ringing me and emailing me this week. It's really helpful. Thank you very much. We're off to an extremely good start in becoming self-sufficient. And thanks to the help of number one son, Jack, uh, all the way down at Plymouth University, we have now got an online facility if you wish to give. So if you are familiar, if you're, if you're a member of our channel, if you've signed up to YouTube, which is a really easy thing to do, where you can see everything that we produce. Um, on our front page, the From the Curate Study front page, to the sort of three quarters of the way up the page on the right, there's a small red dot with a P in it, if you've got extremely good eyesight. And that is a link to our Patreon account. Now that is an online facility where you can simply and easily give a one-off donation or pledge to give a monthly amount, which you can change at any time to support our work here. So if you would do that, it would be very gratefully received. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, traditionally this coming week, churches around the UK would be celebrating what is called rogation. Now rogation is an ancient ceremony that goes back probably 1,000, 1,200 years to something like the eighth century. And during rogation, the people of a parish led by their priest would travel around the boundaries of the parish, stopping at key points to pray for crops, for land, for homes, for farms, for businesses. They might be blessed in the coming year. And they would stop en route uh, to drink beer um, and to eat cheese. So very neatly combining there, two of my favourite activities, that is drinking beer and walking. Um, now, if you're a member of our virtual church community um, in the Curate Study, we can't really do rogation walking, or can we? So over the coming, we're going to have, we'll do something a bit different this year. So two things. If you're a member of our terrestrial parishes and you watch this, on the 5th Sunday of any month that has a 5th Sunday, our services are going to travel around our enlarged 8 parish mission community in a sort of mission community rogation walk. And each of those services, in whichever church they might happen to fall in, will be a particular service designed around that church with opportunities to pray for it, for the congregation, for the officers of the church and for any challenges that they are facing. It will become a sort of enlarged multi-parish rogation walk. I'm not sure if there'll be beer and cheese involved, uh, but there might be some refreshments, all being well. But if you're feeling left out and you're a member of our virtual um, church from the Curate Study, fear not, because what we are going to do is we are going to take you over the next 12 months around our terrestrial parishes. So one service a month uh, or once a month rather, we will feature a different church um, in a, a particular a special online YouTube video leading you around the church, where the church is, some of the historic features of the church and telling you a little bit about it, therefore giving you an opportunity to pray for that church wherever you might find yourself. I hope it'll make you feel included in what we are doing, a sort of a virtual rogation. It's still a bit in flux as to how it's going to work. Angela and I only started talking about it this morning. But I really like the idea of it because I want everybody in the Curate Study to feel part of something as we journey together. So before we begin, 
as part of being together, our collect for today, the church's prayer, a prayer very similar to this one, will be being said in churches from people's houses to grand cathedrals all over the world in, in the Anglican communion, that is churches that roughly hold together as Anglican, wherever they might be. The collect for today. God, our Redeemer, you've delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. Grant that as by his death <coughs> he has called us to life, so by his continual presence in us he may raise us to eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now it's time for our first hymn, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You. this part of our service we seek to clear away the baggage that we've accumulated in the previous week or possibly even before those things that hang he heavy on our hearts and generally or quite often we do this with a confessional prayer followed by an absolution where I remind you that you are a forgiven people it's not a case of the priest forgiving you it's a case of the priest reminding you that you are loved by God and when you come before him honestly and reveal your heart to him, he will always forgive you. So Lord God, we acknowledge our weakness and our sin. We ask you as our creator and redeemer to look into our hearts, the darkest corners of them, and bring into them your light. Let us renew our resolve to have done with all that is evil and confess our sins in penitence and faith. Amen. And now may the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his spirit and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. And now it's time for our reading brought to us by Jude. Jude is a member of our terrestrial congregation in Wimple. Um, she's a keen member of our band. Uh, she's also a, uh, the leader of our new chaplaincy team, which is just being formed. And if that isn't enough, she's also a reader in training. So she's training to become a, a, a licensed lay leader in the church. Thank you, Jude. In today's reading, we are reminded that Jesus's ministry was always about the will of God. Jesus passes God's love onto us and we are then asked to continue to share that love with everyone, um, regardless of who we are. The reading is taken from John, um, chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this 
so that my joy may be in you and that you, your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. So. I read a story this week on the internet, I can't even remember how I came across it, that made me chuckle a little bit. So in an inner city parish, a much loved parish priest was about to move on. He was somebody who was incredibly gifted at preaching, academic, very well educated. Although to be fair, many people felt that his sermons were often way above the heads of most people in his congregation. Now, his successor was, by contrast, a local man with a thick local accent. And in conversation with one of his parishioners, the new vicar was behaved, paid what was perhaps intended to be a compliment, but may not have seemed like it. You and the vicar, the last vicar, the congregation member said, are both really good. But you're quite a contrast, aren't you? Because he was really saintly. Now, I don't have much of a claim to saintliness, as those of you who know me well will probably be well aware of. But I can't help thinking that sometimes one of the ways to be considered to be saintly is to wrap yourself in complicated theology. You see, the reality of the matter is, the more complicated we make theology appear, the more highfalutin and distant our sermons are, the easier it is to get away without saying anything that really affects people a great deal. So if I spent sufficient time on Wikipedia doing cut and paste and cribbing some stuff from some of my books that I've got here, I could wax lyrical, say, for example, about the threefold nature of the Trinity as expressed in the Godhead, couldn't I? And if I did it well enough so that you didn't realise I'd nicked all these clever sayings from somebody else, you might consider me to be wonderfully academic, a gifted preacher, eloquent and able to expound the higher elements of theology. But what would I actually be telling you about your life and where you are currently living and what was going on in the world today? It gets a lot harder, you see, to sound saintly when you start talking about the issues of most people's lives, the muck and the mess and the grey of the world in which we all live. Of course, for some people, they might prefer if I stayed up there in the lofty heights of theology. Because the reality of the matter is, of course, if you do that as a preacher, it removes the responsibility of both yourself and of congregations to actually do anything about what they've heard. The rubber starts to hit the road when a priest starts to get down into the minutiae of real life where most of us live, where things are complicated, very rarely black and white are all cut and dried. So as you've probably been aware, and you may be already be bored with it, I've been banging on a lot recently about change. And spoiler alert, that banging on is probably going to go on for quite a while. But last week, I was in a meeting with a group of people, churchgoers, good people who'd supported their church for a very long time. And when I was talking about change, it was fascinating to hear the range of views that people had had in one small church. So one of the group really did not like the idea of change. They found great comfort in the traditional routines, services, liturgy, hymns of the church. One of the others was the total reverse of this. They found the inability of the church to change remarkably frustrating. Both of them were about the same age. Both of them had served their local church faithfully for probably decades. 
One of them, strangely enough, actually apologised to me for having a different view on the subject. Although in, so as though in some way, by having a strong opinion, this was a, some sort of sin, which, incidentally, it is not. So I've seen two extremes of this, actually, of these, these different opinions. Folks who might say to me something like, if you take out any of these pews from the church, I'll never come back again. And on the other hand, someone who might say to me, do you know what? One of the best things that could happen to our church would be if it burnt down and we'd be rid of this dreadful building that is cold and drafty and we cannot use properly. Now, to be honest, I have problems with both those positions. Because, one, if the pews are foundational to the reason you come to church, it might well be worth you taking a long, hard look at your theology. Um, and also, of course, that sort of thing always sounds a little bit like blackmail to me, and I don't react well when I feel I'm being blackmailed. But on the other hand, we are stewards of beautiful buildings in our terrestrial churches. And the reality of the matter is, of course, if they did burn down, the diocese would just make us rebuild them again. So, while it's tempting to stay up on the theological high ground in Christian life, down in the mud of marshes of where we actually live, people have strong views on many different things. They have strong views on their churches. They have strong views on a range of subjects relating to human sexuality. They have strong views on politics, on work, on the environment, on relationships, on marriage. You name it. People take different positions on it. Being a Christian, you see, is not about miraculously or suddenly deciding we agree on everything. What it's actually about is learning to disagree respectfully. You see, since the beginning of time, people have disagreed. And since the beginning of the church, surprisingly, that has continued. The Christian church has dealt with conflict and disagreement over big stuff and small stuff. And why should it ever stop? Jesus knew this. Why else did he decide, with just hours left to live, to talk to those who followed him about exactly this subject. He knew how divided his disciples could be. He'd already seen it in his own ministry. And in our reading from the Gospel of John, that is exactly what he does. He knows exactly what his disciples are tempted to do and will be tempted to do the minute, so to speak, his back is turned. Judas, for example, will stab him in the back. Peter will deny he exists even three times. The others run away and hide. And you can just imagine the arguments that must have gone amongst this group. And this sets a pattern for the early church. Squabbles over membership, over practice, over money. They had it all, just like we do today. And this has always continued. It is why... There are so many hundreds of different Christian denominations. And it is why, at its very worst, while Chris, why Christians have killed each other by the thousands over pe petty disagreements of theology. So what does, what does Jesus do before all that? Well, the night before his crucifixion, he pulls them all together and he reminds them of who they are and what they have been called to do. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. This is my commandment, that you would love each other as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends. No one has greater love than to give up something that they hold dear. Church is not a group of similar people who all see the world the same way. Church is not a group of people who all look to the world the same way. Church 
is a group of people among whom the Holy Spirit has moved, stirring us up to follow Christ. The Spirit chooses who it chooses, rich or poor, black or white, gay or straight, short or tall, conservative, liberal de democrat, liberal, traditional, modern, free church, Anglican, Catholic, Methodist, United Reformed Church, and lots of others I can't even think of. How, can we, how else could we have ended up with so many different denominations and so many different people worshipping in so many different ways, all with their faces turned towards the same God? We shouldn't be frightened by lively debate. We have it because we care, because it matters. The disciples were not some standardised set of people. They were only joined by one thing. Like us, they were a community united by Christ's love for them. And no matter what the future held, they were, and we are, bound by Christ's love together. And together, they and we have been given a job to do. It's part of our job description. We have to love one another as Christ loved us. This is us. Amid, amid a divided world, what holds us together is not our agreement on tough issues. If we love the pews, or hate the pews, if we want an organ or a band, a service in the morning or in the afternoon. It doesn't matter what we think about this. It doesn't matter what we think about human sexuality. It doesn't matter what we think about politics. It doesn't matter what we think about the EU. It doesn't matter what we think about any of these subjects. And we could list them off, couldn't we? One after another after another. What holds us together is Christ's mutual love for us being portrayed in our mutual love for each other. We are friends of Christ, called to love one another as Christ loved us. And that is something we don't get to take a different view on. And now it's time for our prayers today. Father God, we pray that our risen Saviour may fill us with the joy of his glorious and life-giving giving resurrection through the power of the Holy Spirit that joins us and that we may be his, his eyes and his ears, his hands and his feet in the world, wherever we are called to be and whatever the need. We pray, Lord, for our terrestrial churches, that they would flourish in this new season that through prayer and faithfulness they would find a new way to be your hands and feet in the world today so that we may find fresh strength to preach the good news of the gospel but also to be quiet places of sanctuary and peace. We pray Lord that you would grant us the humility to be subject to one another to admit our doubts and fears in this trying time and to seek help and support when we need it. And we pray, Lord, that your church may do your work to provide for those who lack food, work or shelter, or to those who are vulnerable, whoever and wherever they might be. And we join together our prayers in the prayer that our Saviour himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now it's time for our next hymn, one of my absolute fav uh, favourites, uh, The Days of Elijah.
Thank you for joining us today as we continue our walk both literally and metaphorically uh, with Christ. Um, before you go, a final blessing. God the Father, by whose love Christ was raised from the dead, ensure in you the belief that Christ walks with you day by day and that the Holy Spirit 
holds you forever in the palm of his hand. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and those whom you love, today and always. It's been a joy to spend time with you today, my friends. Until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. God bless.